Well, I hope all of you have had thus far a happy new year. It's new, isn't it? It's young. We've asked Joshua if he'd come up and lead us in the only appropriate song to begin the, the year with. I woke up this morning feeling fire. And, so would you stand together with us? Feeling mighty fine. Y'all got a clap, too. Come on, Let's make sure we got the right tempo. Is that right tempo? I think so. All right, y'all, kick it off. Well, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. I woke up with joy in my soul. Because I knew my Lord had control. Well, I knew I was walking in the light. Because I'd been on my knees in the night. And I pray to the Lord to give me sight. And now I'm feeling mighty fine. Y'all sing with us. Well, I'm feeling mighty fine. I've got heaven on my mind. Oh, don't you know I want to go where the milk and honey flows. There's a light that always shines. Inside this heart of mine, I've got heaven, heaven on my mind, so I'm feeling mighty fine. You want this to take it? Verse 2, we're walking with Jesus all the time. We're walking and talking as we climb. We're traveling a road to the sky. We're with him, we'll live when we die. He's been telling me all about that land. And he tells me that everything is grand. And he says that a home will be mine. People feel. How are you feeling? Are you feeling fine? Feeling fine. Y'all are supposed to help them. No, it's all right. We didn't tell them ahead of time. Happy New Year. Y'all look like you're alive now. Amen. If we don't have something to be alive about, we're in bad shape. When we name the name of Christ, we have his power and glory. And y'all know what else? <clears throat> There's a ladybug up here. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> there it is. It's an old one. Only the. <laughs> Hi, well, we're infested. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully by the Holy Spirit, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Thank you. Good to see all of you today, and we're going to begin our services as we always do, appealing to the Lord. 
to help us as we open his holy word. today, turn to the Old Testament book of Joshua. Just remain standing with us for a moment. Joshua is the sixth book in the Bible. You've got the five books of Moses, followed by the book of Joshua. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. Three. The setting here is the children of Israel are about to cross over the Jordan River into the land that has been promised them. Now those promises have been given to them hundreds of years before, all the way back to Abraham. But you remember in our last study, and we will continue with studying the life of Joseph, uh, after we get over the new year. But you remember when Joseph died, he called all of his brothers together and he said, no, I'm going to die. But he said, I don't want you to bury me because the Lord promised that he's going to move us out of Egypt into the land that he promised us. And uh, they embalmed Joseph. That's in the last chapter of the book of Genesis. They embalmed him. And his body was there for around 400 years. And that was the only Bible that Israel had for, for 400 years. They'd see that coffin and it would remind them of the promise that God had made. Then when the Lord delivered them after about 430 years, you remember because of their disobedience, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, you add all that up together, it's almost been 500 years. And they are still looking to the Lord to fulfill His promises. Now, the United States has only been a nation, not even 250 years. We celebrated our 200th anniversary in 1976. So we're just young compared to all the years that Israel, almost 500 years, and now they're about to enter into the promised land. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and they lodged it there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days, what does that remind you of? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. After three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people, saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and they went before the people. May the Lord add his blessings 
on the reading of his word and let God's people say, praise the Lord, and you may be seated. Today I've given the, our little study uh, the theme of New Year Consolations. I'm going to give you eight New Year Consolations. You notice again here in verse 4 that Joshua made this little statement, at least in this Translation, he says at the end of verse 4, you have not passed this way before. You have not passed this way before. You thought that it was Star Trek, didn't you, on television that said you're about to go where you've never been before. But it was Joshua who uttered those words even hundreds of years, thousands of years before the time of the Messiah, before Jesus came into the world. He says to Israel, you are about to go where you have never been before. Now they're going to cross the Jordan River. All of this is full of types and shadows and figures. The Jordan River signifies in the scripture, it signifies death, it signifies a passing over from this life to the next. Here it signifies crossing into the promised land, and he says you're going to be led by the ark of God. The ark was just a little square chest. It, uh, it had in it Inside the square chest, it had two tables of stones with the Ten Commandments on it. It had the manna that fell down from heaven. And it had a, a rod that had been, a, they called it a rod, it's a dead piece of wood that God made to bud when there was a question about whose choice it was to be the high priest. Of course, Aaron was the high priest. Now, all of that symbolizes Christ. That little box was made of wood. That wood speaks to us of the humanity of Christ. That box was covered inside and outside with pure gold, and that speaks to us of the deity of Christ. Inside of that box was a table, two, two stones containing the Ten Commandments, the law and that reminds us that we are condemned by the law, but that whole box is Christ, and that law is in him, kept in him for our sakes. Then inside that box was the manna from heaven. That's the bread that came down from heaven. Christ said to the Jews, your father did eat that manna, and they died. But this is, speaking of himself, this is the true bread that my father gives you that comes down from heaven, which if a man eat, he shall live forever. And then there was the dead piece of wood that God made to bud, and that speaks of the, the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I spoke to you about that last week. How could a woman who had never been intimate with a man give birth to a child. So all of this speaks to us of Christ. The ark, the containment, what's contained in the ark, what the ark is made up of, the constituents of the ark, all of these things point to Christ. And here they are now about to cross the Jordan River into the promised land, and I thought to myself, we have just crossed over into a new year. We are entering into uncharted territory. Like the children of Israel, we are about to go where we have never been before. Joshua, you know that in the New Testament book of Hebrews, Joshua is called Jesus, and as I have told you many times, from the Hebrew, Joshua and Jesus are the same word. So Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus who is going to lead them into the promised land. You remember Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land. 
He was taken up on a mount, and the Lord let him view the promised land, but he said, you're not going over. Why? Well, one reason was for us. You can't enter the promised land by following Moses. You can't enter the promised land by following the law. It is Joshua, it is Jesus, the Messiah, who must take you into the promised land. So like Israel, we are about to go where we've never been before. And Joshua's admonition to them in this fourth verse suggests change and newness and unfamiliarity and the fear of the unknown. They've been in, Israel, in Egypt for 430 years. They've wandered for 40 years, almost 500 years. Uh, they were wandering because of their unbelief. And now they're going to cross the Jordan River, have never been on the other side of the Jordan River before. They must be thinking, what will it be like? Will we be able to survive? What about all the hostile nations that occupy most of this new territory? What kind of changes will come our way? What about our families? What about our children? What about our elderly? What about our homes? How will we live? Those are all questions that we might be asking as we enter this new year. Several times in our lifetime, we have to enter into uncharted territory. That happens at birth, of course, but we don't really remember much about that. It happens when we go off to school for the first time. It happens when we go off to college or maybe when we enter the workforce or maybe into the military. It happens when we leave home. It happens when we get married. It happens when we move. It happens at death when we enter into a new territory. And it happens when we enter a new year. So as I say again, some of you may be asking some of these same questions about this new year. Some of you are entering jobs. You're entering new jobs, new relationships, maybe new families. You're going through some kind of change. Are you facing any new thing? Are you facing a new challenge or new problems? Are you approaching new territory? Then this is for you. And I have eight things that I want to say to you very simply and straightforwardly about the new year that I hope will prove to be eight words of consolation for you as we cross over into an area where we have never been before, into a new year. Here's the first thing I want you to remember. Number one, you are where you are by divine appointment. How did Israel get to this point? They got there by divine appointment. You say, why in the world did the Lord let them stay 430 years uh, in Israel? Well, we don't know all of the reasons why, but we know that when they went in, there were only just a few over 70 people. Now there are probably two or three million of them, and the Lord is, has grown them. He has a wise purpose behind all of this. And they went out into to the wilderness, and then because of disobedience, they wandered around for 40 years, and here they are now about to cross the Jordan River. They are there by divine appointment. The Bible teaches that God Almighty is actively involved in the affairs of His children. He is at work in every situation on their behalf and for their good. How many times have we read Romans 8, 28? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Everything in itself is not good, but it, He makes it work together for the good of those who belong to Him. And so Israel arrived at the Jordan River not by accident, not by happenstance, not by luck, but by the divine providence of God. And I say the same thing to each of you. You are where you are. You have gotten where you are at this particular time in your journey through life to where you're going to cross over the Jordan River into eternity. You've gotten there by the divine purpose and plan and providence of God. This is that hymn that we sing all the time. He leadeth me. O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words of heavenly comfort, 
thought, wherever I go, wherever I be, tis still God's hand that leadeth me. This is our consolation. He cannot make a mistake. He cannot err. The steps of a good man, the steps of a good woman are ordered by the Lord. We can say with David, my times are in thy hand. So here's the first word. You're where you are by divine appointment. Here on January 2nd, 2022, you're where you are in your life by divine appointment. Number two, your pathway is going to be new to you because it's a new year, but it's not new to the Lord. It's not new to Him. I have said many times over the years here to this congregation, I've asked this question, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? He knows all things actual. He knows all things possible. He knows what could happen. He knows what will happen with him. There is no past. There is no future. He is the I am he encompasses all of time and all of eternity. And that which may be right now troubling you was known of the Lord before you were born. Nothing takes him by surprise. There are no emergencies to him. His battery of power never runs low. He's not only aware of where you are, but just like the children of Israel, he's been leading you every step of the way, whether you knew it or not. It was the God of Abraham who led Israel, not only in the way they knew, but in the way he knew. And this is our real consolation. If he knows the way I take, then I must simply learn to trust him to lead me through it. Number three, your situation is not new to God's people. Israel's fathers and grandfathers had not crossed the Jordan River, but they had crossed the Red Sea. They hadn't faced enemies in Canaan, but they had faced enemies in Egypt. And this simply means that their situation was not new. It was not peculiar. It was not unique. Others had been through the very same thing. Others had faced the same obstacles. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. What do we do? God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Peter wrote to the Christians in 1 Peter 4.12, and he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. That is, many Christians, many children of God have gone through the trials that some of us are going through or will go through. How do you think Abraham felt when God told him to leave his home, leave his family, leave his nation, leave his country, and go to a strange new, less, uh, new land. How did he handle it? Well, here's what we're told in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with him of the same promise. In other words, he walked by faith. He just trusted the Lord. He didn't know where he was going, how long he would be gone, how much time it would take to get there. He just trusted the God who did know. So we're leaving the old year and we're entering the new year. So remember, there's nothing really new or unique about your particular situation. Many of God's people have traveled the very same road and God brought every one of them through. Number four, Nothing that lies ahead of you can be worse or more dangerous than anything experienced by other children of God. There's some of you here today that you have had a real testing and a real trial over the last couple of years. 
Uh, I could name names, but I won't do that because you know who you are. Some of you have had real health issues. Some of you have had uh, economic issues. Some of you have had family issues, uh, work issues. But I want you to realize, I want you to remember that nothing you are going to experience is more dangerous, uh, more trying than anything experienced by other children of God. In fact, we read about them in the Scriptures, don't we? Some of us fear growing old. Have you ever thought that many people have been denied the privilege of growing old? Uh, who took care of you when you were young? Who took care of you when you were born into the world? Certainly you did not take care of yourself. The Lord took care of you. Who took care of you when you were young? Wasn't the Lord? You'd go back and think of some times that you experienced when probably you should have died or you should have been killed. Or I have lots of friends that I think about that I was with in school, and they're dead. I think of two of them in particular. One of them was killed on a motorcycle, had a girlfriend, and he had never had a girlfriend before, and his girlfriend broke up with him. Oh, it just so broke his heart that he got on his motorcycle. And back in those days, not a lot of people in junior high had motorcycles. He had a great big, huge Harley Davidson 74. It was the kind that the police, beautiful blue, I can see it right now, beautiful blue. He was the only guy in the whole school that had this motorcycle. He bought it himself. But he was so distraught over his girlfriend breaking up with him, he got on his motorcycle and he drove to Jacksonville, Florida. And he drove all night. And the next morning in Jacksonville, he was so tired and sleepy, he didn't realize he was going the wrong way on a one-way street. And an automobile hit him and threw him 50, 60, 70 feet. He was dead instantly when he killed him. His name was Emery Huffstetler. I remember it like it was yesterday. 15 years old, gone out into eternity. You remember another friend named Herbie Carter. Herbie was going down a road called Gillianville Road. And I don't know what he was doing. I don't know if he was drinking. I don't know if he was paying attention. I don't know if he was laughing. But he was going around a curve. His car went off into the ditch. He controlled it until it hit a cul-de-sac. And then it threw him through the windshield. And uh, the windshield, they said, did such a nice job cutting his throat. It looked like a surgeon had done it. And he bled out in about 20 seconds, and he's dead, Herbie Carter. He was in, uh, I think, a freshman or a sophomore in school. So I think of a lot of people. When I get my, I'm old enough now, <laughs> when I get my graduating class list, over 60% of them are deceased. They're gone out into eternity. I don't know which of them knew the Lord and which of them didn't, but I know this. As I think about that, I think of how merciful the Lord has been to me because there have certainly been situations in my life when if it had taken its course as it should have, I would have been gone. I would have been out of here. So I am here by the grace of God, and I am what I am by the grace of God, and I intend to finish my course by the grace of God because he who took care of me when I was born, he who took care of me when I was young, who has taken care of me all of these years, and he will take care of me when I am ready, when he's ready for me to cross the Jordan River. He has promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You remember, one of the best things about growing old is it takes such a long time to get there. You fear poverty? You're wondering, I don't know, this is the present administration, people are talking now about gasoline, they're talking about everything going up, how are we going to make it, what are we going to do? My advice to you is to pray to the Lord and trust Him. He'll make a way out of no way. Are you wondering how you're going to get along? Well, He owns the cattle upon a thousand hills and the, the hills too. He owns all of the real estate. You don't have any real estate. It all belongs to him. It's on loan to you as a steward. How are you going to use it? Your house belongs to him. Your automobile belongs to him. All your money belongs to him. All your stocks and bonds belong to him. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to use it? We're going to use it for ourselves or we're going to use it for him and for his glory. 
Paul said this to the Philippians. He said, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My friends, I'm not bragging on myself. Those of you who have known me for a while know that I detest that. I detest braggarts. And I'm going to tell you, when I came to Tennessee, uh, the, the church did all they could for me. They gave me $50 a week. I got two jobs. I started working. Here I am now, uh, 51 years later. I don't owe one dime to anybody. My house is paid for. My automobile is paid for. Everything's paid for. As far as I know, I'm in pretty good health for the age I'm, I am. You know, pretty good shape for the shape you're in. <laughs> And well, what, how, did I, how did we get here? How did my wife and I and our son, how did we get here? Now we have a beautiful uh, daughter-in-law. We have three grandchildren. How did we get here? By the grace of God. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And Paul reminded the church at Ephesus, he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Remember this, your situation is not new to God's people of the past. Therefore, your position and your condition cannot be worse or more dangerous. He brought them through it. He'll bring you through it. Number five, this is a tough one. Neither fear nor worry will diminish the danger or change the situation. The toughest thing in the world when you're facing a really bad situation is not worrying about it. But the Lord Jesus told his disciples, he said, look, you can't make one hair white or black. He said, your hairs are all numbered. The Lord's been doing some subtraction on me for the last 15 years. I have my hair just grow way down here, almost to my eyebrows. It's not only changed colors, it's moved back a little bit. But let me tell you this, not one of them could have come out without the permission of my Father in heaven. And he said to his disciples, look, not one sparrow can come to the ground without your Father's permission, and you are worth more than many sparrows. So let me tell you this, let me tell you from experience, Neither fear nor worry will diminish the danger or change the situation. You've never accomplished anything by worry. Why not rejoice in the Lord over your present mercies rather than worry over what you think are coming trials? Instead of looking at what you lost, look at what you still have. When the outlook looks bad, try the uplook. One of my favorite little quotes, and I've used it several times over the years, is this. Set the, the robin to the sparrow. The robin to the sparrow. I would really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. You know, there are almost 800,000 words in the Bible. Not once can we find the word worry among them. So the conclusion is obvious. If worry is not in our God's vocabulary, it shouldn't be in ours. Somebody said this, worry is an emotion that can never empty tomorrow of its problems, but it does empty today of its strength. Somebody said this, it can never help us escape evil, but it does make us ill-prepared to cope with it if it comes. And I know this, I've learned this, faith ends where worry begins. When I'm worrying, I'm not really trusting the Lord. And when I'm trusting the Lord, I can't be worrying. So have you ever tried trusting the Lord while you were worried? Because Israel was trusting in the Lord, they were not worried. And one way their faith was strengthened was by recollecting, looking back at past mercies and present blessings. Number six, 
If our God has always proved faithful, why should he now fail us? Joshua could remind Israel that God had been faithful in Egypt. He had been faithful through the wilderness when they were hungry. He gave them quail from heaven. He made manna fall for 40 years. And you know that manna continued to fall all of the time they were wandering. It didn't stop falling until they entered into the promised land. When they entered into the promised land, it stopped falling. Didn't need it. And the Lord will supply for us all the days of our life. Only when we cross the Jordan and enter into the heavenly promised land, we won't need any of those other things then. We won't need a bit of those those things. Our God has always proved faithful He's not going to fail us now. He was faithful to Israel in Egypt. He was faithful to them in the wilderness. He was faithful at the Red Sea when their enemies were coming. He opened it up and they crossed over. Why should his faithfulness fall now that they were about to cross the Jordan? The Lord has promised in Psalm 89, My loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. God has never failed to fulfill his promise to those who trust him. Number seven, to pass to new ground means the old ground is gone. If you think about it, in every loss, something is gained. And our God has arranged things in such a way that when he takes something from us, he gives us something better. Israel left the garlic and the onions of Egypt, and they gained the provisions of heaven. They left the wilderness to gain the promised land. They were thirsty, he gave them water from a rock. They were hungry, he gave them manna from heaven and quail without number. When Moses died, what are we going to do now? He gave them Joshua. And so remember this. When the Lord lays a new burden upon you, he removes the old one. And he has made special promises to those who trust in him regarding what may seem to be special burdens. I guarantee you this. If you trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not into your own understanding, He'll make every stumbling block a stepping stone. He'll make every obstacle an instrument of advancement. And every enemy, he'll make that a servant to aid you in whatever he has called you to do. He makes all things work together for good. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then God is for you. That's what the Bible says in Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Even death, the great enemy of all mankind, proves to be a friend to us by becoming the door to heaven. Solomon said this, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, our greatest enemy is death. It's called uh, an enemy. Death is called an enemy, the, the last enemy that shall be destroyed. But our Lord has made death the believer's servant to escort us into his presence. So I say to you, we've, we've entered new ground here. We've crossed into a new year. The old ground's gone forever. But the God who was with us in the old ground will be with us in this new ground. And if you go to him and seek his face, seeking him, acknowledging where you failed, acknowledging what you have not done that you should have done, or what you did do that you shouldn't have done, he will forgive you. The Bible tells that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And by the way, you check this out. That word confess doesn't mean name them one by one. You don't know all the sins you've committed. You can't remember all the sins you've committed. Under the law in the Old Testament, they had an offering for sins of ignorance. 
That word confess in 1 John 1, 9 is the word acknowledge. Acknowledge. You acknowledge you have sinned. You acknowledge that you are a sinner. And get this now. You'll have to, you'll have to check me out on this. Do some studying on your own. If you acknowledge your sin, it says he's faithful and he's just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? First of all, it means that God's faithfulness will never fail. Secondly, it means that his matter of justice, it is a matter of justice that he forgive us and cleanse us from our sins because Christ has satisfied the justice of the law on our behalf. So it is a matter of justice for God to forgive us. Then it says, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do you think that means? Well, it means when you acknowledge that you're a sinner, he not only will wipe away the sin you have in mind, but he takes care of all the other sins too. The ones that you can't even remember. I know from time to time you'll have something that'll flash back in your mind out of your past. We all have that. But you know, God has no past and he has no future. He is the I am that I am, and we abide in him, and therefore we have no past. We have nothing to answer for. We are forgiven of all of our sins. And this brings me to the eighth word of consolation, the last one, and it is this. To move into a new challenge, a new year, may imply a change in trials and a change in difficulties, but it does not imply a change in in the Lord. He doesn't change. We're changing all the time. Everything around us is changing. But he does not change. The point is, anything and everything that we could trust can and will change, including ourselves, but our salvation is not dependent upon us remaining the same, but upon him who does not change. We're warned in the Bible not to trust anything or anyone that changes. Proverbs 24, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Everything changes but the Lord. Fear the Lord and the king. Don't meddle with those that are given the chains. Now, that word, that, that Hebrew word translated chains there is the word shana. You know what it means? It, it means two things. Number one, it means to alter. And this is the sense we are taught to avoid those who attempt to change what God has established as normal and right. We've got a society now that want to change. They want to change everything that God has established. And I don't know if you can see it, but I can certainly see it. I can see our, our culture, our society going down. I can see it broken up. I can see that there's going to be trial and trouble ahead. May not for some of us, we may not be here, but for others of you, there will be. Because people are trying to change what God has established as the normal and the right way. The scripture says that marriage is between a man and a woman. The scripture says he named them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. The scripture says that God Almighty has established certain principles, and when you try to change those, you will eventually be ruined by them. Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes 3.14, I know that whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God does it, that men should fear before him. So this word shana means to alter. The second meaning of that term is to put on another face, to disguise. Changing people are not genuine they change with the seasons. They are what you call fair weather friends. They're with you when everything is going well, but when you have a need, then you can't find them. Well, the only one you can really depend on in all seasons and at all times is the Lord. He is the one who changes not. All of us are given somewhere, somehow, to change. 
But when the storm clouds arise, those fair weather friends disappear. Listen to Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I am the Lord, I change not. Our Lord Jesus Christ can be trusted because he possesses the attribute of unchangeableness. We call that immutability. He is immutable. He does not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13 and verse 8. He's always the same in his person, always the same in his purposes. He's never different. What he promised yesterday is good today, and it will be good tomorrow. He will always keep his word. Learn to trust in him. Learn to have confidence and hope in him. My dear friends, the God that I serve is a sovereign God. He is not trying to be God. It's not that he would like to be God if we'll let him. He is God. He does rule. He does reign. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? He has mercy upon whom he will, and whom he will he hardens. God does not change. He does not change his mind. He does not change his plans. He does not change his affection. He does not change his love. If he ever loved you, he loves you still. Even if you've messed up, even if you have sinned against him, even if you've been a rebel since you came to be his child, he still loves you and he will restore you. You turn to him. You confess to him. Whatever happened this past year, 2020, come it, bring it to him. Bring it to him and he will wipe that away and he'll bless you in 2022. So remember, new and difficult trials don't mean God has changed in his love toward us. In fact, I believe the Bible teaches that trials ripens us for heaven. Difficulties cause us to look beyond ourselves for help. Trials in this world make us long for another world. The children of Israel won't be afraid to cross the Jordan River because they know about the God that has sustained them from Egypt up to that point. And when the Lord calls us out of this world, let me tell you this, just rest in Him, just like you're resting in Him now. All of these things will change. They'll all come to pass, but the God we serve does not change. I hope you'll think about these eight consolations, very simple stuff. Today, if there's a difference between preaching and teaching, then I've tried to teach you today. Trials in this world only make us sick of this world, ready for the next. We'll not be afraid of 2022 because of the God that kept us in 2021. May the Lord add his blessings to his word. Let's stand together. All right, now, while I have you standing, you probably need to stand up anyway. <laughs> from time to time, the Lord sends people here to us, and then from time to time, we lose some people. And we've got a couple of friends here today, Bob and Wendy Smith. They're going to be moving to Florida, and we wanted to acknowledge that today. We wanted to acknowledge them and Lynn. I can turn that over to you if you no, think they want to talk. Turn your mic on. Uh, on purposes of God, right? <laughs> it couldn't have been any clearer of wherever you go, take the gospel, take it with you. Be, a mis be one of those messengers that talk to your neighbor, and anywhere you are, you're there on purpose, <laughs> right? So Bob and Wendy, they want to say something to our family. This is our family. It's the family of God, and, uh, and uh, they want to tell y'all uh, just, just for a minute about what they're doing and how they're doing, and uh, oh. I'm going to give you all this mic and just hold it between you, okay? Oh. So, so this is what it looks like up here. Yeah, this is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to thank everybody for uh, their open arms, their support, everything we've been given since we've been here. It's been unbelievable. 
we're going to miss this. You know, been crazy. I'm not good at this. <laughs> so, again, thank you. I just feel like I can't really even talk, but you'll, you'll always be with us, and we're going to be here um, by video. And the love and support from everybody here has been more than we've ever experienced because we didn't have this before we came to Tennessee. So this has been a life-changing experience for us, and um, I hope you'll just know that you guys will always be with us, and thank you so very much. Thank you, Bill and Lynn. You know, I've, I've watched the Lord perform miracles with them, especially Bob. He's brought him out of the jaws of death twice, I know of, and probably more than that. And the prayers of this family has strengthened him and lifted him up, knowing that we were there. Todd called him every night, every morning, early morning, every night. Every night. You called him every night while he was in the hospital in Michigan. He mentioned that to me. Those are fam That's family. You know, it's not just friends. It's family. Uh, the family of God feels the pain of the other one, and they don't mind shedding some tears about it, too, you know? I mean, it's okay to cry about it, about other people's pains. I've been ministering a little bit to Shirley Murphy. She's in bad shape. She fell Christmas Eve. She's torn her pectoral muscles and things of that nature. And, but she's a tough thing, but God will lift her up and teach her some things. Um, through all of this, but y'all call her and see about it. But with Bob and Wendy, we're gonna miss them. I mean, she's like my little sister. <laughs> In fact, my grandchildren thought she was my sister when she first came. But uh, but anyway, we love them, and we'll go down to Florida and see you. Okay. Doors always open I for know. anybody. I know. Who comes down. I know, and y'all just take care of each other, and find a place to worship. That's what I always tell you people. Them. Yeah. Well, on TV, <laughs> we got one. <laughs> but fellowship with believers, that's what's important. The fellowship of believers. We want to ask you to be praying for Bob and Wendy. Lynn, I'm going to ask you if maybe if you'll lead them back there at the back. Anybody wants to say anything to them today when the service is over, you can do that. Uh, but we do want to pray for them. Uh, we don't know what the future holds. You know, they had to move before. Uh, they had to move back up to Michigan, and then the Lord moved them back down here. So we don't know. He might move them north this time instead of moving them south from Florida. But wherever they are, as I kept saying today over and over and over, the God we serve doesn't change. We may change. We may change locales, houses, jobs, whatever, but he doesn't change. Our hope is in him. So let's pray for Bob and Wendy. Let's be sure that we pray for them and ask the Lord to lead them to find somewhere <clears throat> that takes the word of God seriously. They're getting uh, few between, really. There's a lot, a, lot of, a lot of liberalism out there, it's called. I don't believe in liberalism. I believe you either believe the Bible or you don't believe it. It's not a matter of being liberal with, with Scripture. It's a matter of believing it or not. Might have various and sundry interpretations and translations, but either the Bible is the Word of God or it is not the Word of God. So let's remember Bob and Wendy, Okay. All right, let's pray. Our Father, we call upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace and mercy to Bob. We thank you for recovering him from a very near death experience. We know it was not your will for him to leave this world because you recovered him in a miraculous way. We pray, Father, that he will continue to be strengthened that he will never forget your faithfulness to him and for his help meet Wendy who stood right by him. They stand together, Lord. We ask you to bless them and we ask you to lead them to a, an assembly that takes the word of God seriously. We pray, Father, that you will bless this assembly in 2022. We might see great things accomplished for our Lord and for our Savior above all that he might be glorified at our expense. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. All right. All right, I'll dismiss you with that.